Welcome everyone. On behalf of the um, seven organizations, um, the meeting is uh, supported and sponsored by Jewish Network for Palestine, BrickUp, ICAD UK, Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign, Convivencia Alliance, the Brighton and Hove uh, PSC, and the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. I will present the speakers just before they start. I wish to remind you a few facts about normalization, about normalizing Israel and Zionism. Um, normalization did not start in 2020 with the Abraham Accords. It did not start with 19, in, in 1979 with the peace agreements and not even after 1967 or even in 1949 when some Arab countries signed ceasefire agreements with Israel. The main move to normalize Zionism started, arguably, with the British Empire and its Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate, which followed, designed to allow Zionism total control over Palestine and subdue the indigenous population, de denying its rights. The West has followed this after 1948 and is still holding this line, all rights to Zionism, no rights to the Palestinians. I want to say that in JNP, we believe that normalization is abnormal as it normalizes that which is illegal, immoral, and unjustifiable. I will now invite Omar Barghouti to speak. Um, and Omar Barghouti, which requires no uh, introduction, is uh, the Palestinian human rights defender and co-founder of uh, the Palestinian-led boycott, divestment, and sanctions, the BDS movement for Palestinian rights. He is a co-recipient of the 2017 Gandhi Peace Award. He holds a BSc and an MSc in electrical engineering from Columbia University, New York, and is pursuing a PhD in philosophy in the area of ethics at the University of Amsterdam. He is the author of BDS, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights, Haymarket 2011. His commentaries and views have appeared in New York Times, The Guardian, Washington Post, The Financial Times, The Nation, and MSNBC, CNN, BBC, among others. Uh, Omar will speak for around 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, I don't know anyone who is a better person to present uh, BDS and normalization uh, to all of us. Omar. Please take it away. Uh, thanks a lot, time uh, for this uh, introduction. Um, I will speak actually for a shorter period because I'm much more interested in the discussion that that may follow. Um, in trying to prepare, I've been trying for a week to prepare for this, and I thought the best way is to walk us through the anti-normalization guidelines that are posted on the BDS movement's website to try to explain the nuances and the intricacies and give some examples uh, in this presentation. So I thought that might be the most helpful, constructive way of approaching uh, this issue. Uh, let me start by saying that we recognize for a largely Western audience, the issue of normalization is not very easy to discuss. Um, for those who are not experts in, in the uh, colonial conflict that we're dealing with, uh, normalization in the English language has a positive meaning, uh, largely. When states end uh, a state of war, they normalize relations. So it's something positive to look forward to. In Arabic, tatbiya, making something that is abnormal look deceptively normal, is certainly not something positive. Um, and uh, despite the history that Heim gave, that the specific concept of tatbir, of normalization in the Arab world, emerged in the uh, context of the Camp David Accords between uh, the Egyptian regime and Israel. 
uh, that's when uh, the, the discussion about normalization in the Arab world reached a peak and the concept started becoming uh, much more uh, used by, by activists, intellectuals, uh, and so on. So again, it, is, it means making something abnor inherently abnormal, like oppression, uh, seem deceivingly normal. Um, I once uh, um, used the example of a master and a slave dancing. Uh, as um, something that's shockingly uh, normalizing. It cannot be love ever because there's a master-slave relationship. Uh, for, there, for there to be a possibility of love between this person and that person, uh, slavery must end. Uh, freedom, emancipation must, must uh, obtain. Otherwise, there's no possibility of ethical coexistence, let, let alone love. So this is the philosophical basis for this uh, concept, that in order for an ethical coexistence to happen between currently oppressed communities and currently oppressor communities, oppression must end. Uh, uh, recognition of the basic rights of the oppressed must happen, and the relationship must be one of co-resistance, which I'll explain uh, later. So this uh, concept of uh, normalization in the BDS movement specifically, uh, and the BDS movement played a very important role in defining normalization, which, which has always been a very fluid concept in the Arab world. As I said in the Camp David Accords with Egypt and so on, it, it's, it remained a fluid concept with various syndicates of artists, academics, intellectuals, and, and various activists defining it very, very differently from uh, maximalist definitions to minimalist definitions. Uh, some organizations try to make them make the, the concept suit their agenda, usually funding agendas, and, and we'll get to that. So the BDS movement took it upon itself the BNC, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions National Committee, which is the largest coalition in Palestinian society, in Palestine as well as in exile, that leads the global BDS movement. In 2007, specifically in its first national conference, which was held in the occupied territory, uh, um, and it was attended by who's who in Palestinian society, basically all major political, cultural, social, grassroots, mass movement entities. All of them were present. Uh, um, um, and amazingly, I, I mean, I did not see that coming. The, the document we presented as a draft for defining normalization and the guidelines to uh, fight normalization was accepted unanimously. There was absolutely no one against it. And that, that came as a surprise. And, and when I get to the details, you'll understand why that's a surprise uh, in a way. So that concept in the BDS movement was developed in 2007. So we made it very, very specific because we cannot afford very uh, ambiguous language in such a sensitive area of relations between Israelis and Arabs, including Palestinians. So I'll, I'll, I'll quote this part. Normalization is the participation in any project, initiative, or activity, local or international, that brings together, on the same platform that is, brings together Arabs, including Palestinians, and Israelis, whether institutions or individuals, and does not meet the following two conditions. First, the Israeli side publicly recognizes the UN affirmed inalienable rights of the Palestinian people, which are set out in the 2005 BDS call. And the second condition is that the joint activity constitutes a form of co-resistance against the Israeli regime of occupation, settler colonialism, and apartheid. Uh, again, Israeli side means Jewish Israelis or Jewish Israeli institutions, as the case may be. And I'll address the issue, but the BDS movement does not target individuals. How come normalization guidelines discuss individual Israelis? I'll answer that uh, uh, question. Uh, we're, we've anticipated that. Um, now, why did we insist on those two conditions? I mean, what, of course, it's, it's good that we have two very clear conditions, but why insist on those specific conditions? First, because we assume that there can be a normal relationship between Palestinians and Israelis, between Arabs and Israelis, that is one of co-resistance against the system of oppression. People forget this, but if you go to the BDS call, 
and it's uh, I mean it's it's one page it's it's amazing how how much people miss on that one page on that one page we call on conscientious Israelis to join us in the struggle to end oppression remember the BDS call was signed by every single Palestinian political party every single ma mass organization Palestinian I mean it was signed by the entirety of Palestinian society minus very little so everyone agrees that we call on conscientious Israelis, anti-colonial Israelis, to join us in the struggle to end oppression. So the assumption here is that we don't see a dichotomy that is uh, uh, insurmountable, that oppressors and oppressed will remain as such because there's a DNA difference between us, identity difference between us. No, it's the oppression that's keeping us apart. We end oppression, and when there's recognition of rights, then there's a possibility of ethical coexistence. That is the basis of our anti-normalization uh, work. To normalize relations, we need to end oppression, basically, so to speak. Um, now, normalization as a joint activity between the oppressed and the oppressor that is not based on recognition of rights and not based on a, a joint struggle to eliminate oppression uh, is seen as an attempt by the oppressor or those who support the oppressor to colonize the minds of the oppressed with the notion that oppression is a fact of life, live with it, hope with it, do not resist it. Israel is so powerful, supported by empire, by Europe, you know, there's no way you can defeat this system of oppression, so you might as well live with it, coexist with it. Uh, but this is unethical coexistence because it's based on oppression. That is a, a very important point. So this attempt to colonize our minds, saying that, you know, Israel and the Palestinians, Israel and the Arabs, they're just, they have a conflict. They're symmetric parties that have a conflict between them. They disagree on certain issues, but all disputes can be resolved. Why not uh, make those personal human relations thrive? Because that's a way to overcome the hate, to overcome uh, uh, the psychological barriers. Uh, uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not making fun of anyone. This language is used by otherwise very intelligent people around the world. We hear it from top academics and intellectuals and artists and, and policymakers and presidents and prime ministers uh, uh, overcome hate with dialogue and with coexistence projects hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, uh, since uh, Oslo till now, billions of dollars have been spent on normalization projects, mainly by the US, Germany, the UK, France, and the rest of the White West. Uh, um, to them, that's extremely important to make their settler colony, Israel, accepted by the oppressed community, by the indigenous Palestinians, as well as the larger Arab community. It's, it's a key issue make Israel acceptable as a regime of oppression, you shall accept it as a reality and deal with it. Well, we won't. That attempt to colonize our minds has not succeeded and it cannot succeed, as I will show later, and not just for Palestinians, but also for Arabs. Uh, despite the Abraham Accords that I mentioned, uh, uh, it's not showing on, on the ground when we deal with Arab public opinion, uh, and, and we'll get to that. So we see normalization as a weapon used by Israel's regime of oppression to whitewash the system of, of injustice and undermine international solidarity with the Palestinian liberation struggle. So they use the slogan, don't be more Arab than the Arabs. If you know, Israelis and Palestinians are work, working together, uh, uh, doing, um, I don't know, baking bread for peace, which, which was a project one, one day, uh, uh, women uh, uh, working together against sexism in the abstract. There's so many normalization uh, um, uh, projects. Um, so when an international person from the UK, South Africa, India, whatever the case may be, says, I'm not going to this conference in Israel, I'm not participating in that event sponsored by the Israeli government or a complicit Israeli institution, Tel Aviv University, whatever the case may be, then the Israelis who are doing this normalization can tell the Indian or South African or the American activist, well, why don't you join? I mean, the Arabs are already here, the Palestinians are already participating. Why do you want to boycott? Don't be more Arab than the Arabs. Don't be more Palestinian than the Palestinians. A very important inspiration for our anti-normalization work comes from South Africa. 
several of us, personally, I was involved in the South African anti-apartheid movement when I went to school at uh, Columbia. And then it was clear cut uh, to us as the guidelines came from South Africa, that they don't work with white South Africans unless they're explicitly opposed to apartheid. And they call on all internationals actually not to work with white South Africans in any capacity. Don't invite academics, don't invite artists, don't invite any white South African to anything unless they explicitly op oppose apartheid. That is a maximalist position actually that we did not adopt in the BDS movement when we launched it in 2005. As you can see from our guidelines, they're much softer than the South African guidelines. It's not a blanket boycott against any relationship. We don't call on internationals to boycott individual Israelis. BDS is opposed to individual boycotts because we, we, we target uh, complicity, not identity. And I'll explain the difference then. Am I contradicting myself saying on the one hand, the BDS movement and its international guidelines targets institutions, not individuals. Yet, when it comes to normalization, you're saying no relations with any Israeli, except if those two conditions are met. There's no contradiction in here, and I'll explain it uh, uh, later. So just to mention that the South African uh, dimension, the South African inspiration is very real, very important, yet we have not adopted the maximalist position adopted by South Africans in their struggle. Uh, we, we adapted it to our Palestinian Arab uh, specifics, actually. Now, um, normalization activities um, um, can take many shapes and forms. Um, we can get into some uh, details. A conference that brings uh, um, Palestinians slash Arabs, Egyptians, Tunisians, whatever the case may be, with Israelis. Uh, and in that panel in that uh, uh, um, uh, meeting, there is no recognition of Palestinian rights, and the meeting itself is not opposed to the system of oppression. We consider that as normalization, because obviously it gives uh, uh, this false impression of, of symmetry between oppressor uh, and oppressed. Um, it, and it can be a multilateral uh, event, let's say a Mediterranean, Euromed, whatever workshop, uh, held in Cyprus, the preferred uh, place to hold such uh, meetings, uh, uh, or Germany, whatever the case may be, uh, bringing Israelis and people from the Arab world together in a workshop to discuss, uh, you know, uh, climate change. We're not discussing Palestinians or Israelis or the con conflict, quote unquote. We're discussing climate change, which is above everyone else. I mean, concerns everyone. So why, why should we bring in politics into such an important existential issue, such as climate change, climate justice? So can't we work together at least on this common ground of fighting climate change? Of course, climate change is extremely important, but why do we have to be squeezed in with Israelis as if Israel is a normal part of this re re region? Why should Arabs accept that? when Israel continues to be a, a, a regime of settler colonialism, apartheid and military occupation. It cannot be welcome as a normal member of the region. It cannot, we cannot accept that this system of oppression, just like South Africa was not accepted in the African continent at large and in much of the world until it ended its system of apartheid. Exactly the same criteria should apply. Why should we accept Israel's presence in any forum but what about international forums then? The Olympics, the United Nations, uh, uh, FIFA, uh, uh, international conferences held outside the Arab world. Uh, do we call for a boycott of these conferences? Festivals, artistic festivals, cultural events, and so on. Uh, uh, it depends. So there, there's a distinction. If this event is happening in the Arab world, and since Israel is still a regime of oppression that's oppressing Palestinian Arabs. And since the question of Palestine is an Arab question, not just a Palestinian uh, question, centuries of, of kinship between Palestinians and other Arabs, uh, uh, and, and we define Arabs not in an ethnic and national uh, um, sense, but in a much more progressive, inclusive sense, because there are other nationalities, other ethnicities in the Arab region, uh, Kurds, Amazigh, Armenians, and others and others that are absolutely part of this Arab uh, region. So we don't use Arab in a very ethnic or national way, and we explain that on the BDS movement website. 
So anyway, going back to the question of if this event is happening in the Arab region, then we say Israel should never be welcome. And now, if an Israeli is invited, let's say Haim is invited, uh, or Neve or Ilan, or you know, what, one of our Jewish Israeli partners who supports for Palestinian rights. In the BDS movement, we see no problem whatsoever, because then that person is not going to this conference in Cairo, Tunisia, or Amman as Mr. or Miss Israel. They're not representing the flag. They're representing themselves as anti-Zionist Jewish Israelis who support fully Palestinian rights under international law, and they don't just passively support the rights, they are working with us, co-resisting to end the system of oppression. So in the BDS movement, we don't see that as normalization. But otherwise, it is normalization to have any Israeli invited to an event in the Arab world. Now, the same conference or festival is now not in the Arab world. It's in India or France. Would the same conditions apply? No, because of the different, different relationship between India and Palestine, between France and Palestine, between Brazil and Palestine, we do not apply the same guidelines because BDS is context sensitive. Context is everything. Uh, in international events outside the Arab region, we simply say that if the event is sponsored by Israel, its lobby groups or its complicit institutions, it becomes boycottable. Most international events are not, so there's that's a rare occasion when Israel sponsors it or uh, Hebrew University sponsors a, a major international event outside. That doesn't happen very commonly. What happens more commonly is uh, Israel might sponsor a part of the event and that part becomes boycottable, or in most cases, there is no sponsorship at all, but the organizers, you know, mostly white, Europeans, white Americans, white in general, are interested in you know bringing those oppressors and oppressed uh, together. It, it looks so nice and uh, cuddly and, and beautiful seeing Israelis and Palestinians or, or Tunisians or Egyptians or Kuwaitis on the same panel or Lebanese uh, uh, discussing something of common interest, uh, be it nuclear physics or uh, uh, geography or uh, women's rights in, in Somalia whatever the case may be, just as long as you accept this normal relationship between Israelis and Arabs. That is what we reject. So participation in an international event is, is okay, as long as the organizers do not try to bring this, uh, tokenize us, to bring us together with Israelis as if we're normal uh, 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 interlocutors, normal partners in a panel or in an event or in a dance or in a theater, in any form. That is, uh, that is tokenizing us, that's politicizing us, to use the liberal term of politicization, uh, 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 that in a way that is very dehumanizing and unacceptable uh, to Palestinians and, and uh, most uh, Arabs. Um, so uh, let me move on. Um, I will. I mentioned before that despite the Abraham Accords, despite billions of dollars being spent by the White West to normalize Israel in the region as a settler colonial uh, uh, system, it has not succeeded largely with the Arab public. Let me give an example, a very recent example from the Arab Opinion uh, Index, which is uh, the most authoritative uh, um, uh, academic research into uh, public opinion in the Arab world. So this was published uh, not too long ago. This is the 2022 uh, statistics. So when, um, when people were asked, when people in the Arab world were asked about which countries uh, is the, do you think the policies of some international powers threaten the security and stability of the region? That was the question. And they were given choices, China, Turkey, France, Russia, Iran, USA, and Israel. Which one presents a threat to the security and stability of the region? 74% uh, chose Israel as certainly a threat, and 10% said it is uh, uh, yes to some extent. So together, that's 84% of Arab public opinion sees Israel as certainly, or to a large extent, a threat the biggest threat to the security and stability of the region. The USA comes next, of course, with 62% certainty that it is a threat and 16% uh, uh, saying it's, it, uh, it is to an extent a threat. 
and then Iran and then Russia and then France and then Turkey and then China. Uh, uh, that's one example of public opinion, which is quite interesting. Now, uh, when uh, the Arab publics were asked about um, attitudes toward the Palestinian cause, how central is Palestine to people in the Arab region? Uh, uh, because from the Abraham Accords since 2020, we've been hearing, oh, no one cares about Palestine. You know, with the Arab Spring and and with uh, social and, and 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 economic justice movements and and all the upheavals against dictatorships across the Arab world, people are too busy to care about Palestine. It, the research does not show that. In fact, uh, seventy six percent of respondents in the Arab region agreed that the Palestinian cause concerns all Arabs. Seventy six percent in a country like. Egypt, which has had the longest uh, uh, um, normalization agreement with the state uh, of Israel. Uh, let me just check. The numbers are very small. 75% uh, said that the Palestinian cause concern all Arabs. 75%. So even in Egypt, three quarters of the Egyptian people feel uh, this way. So this is just a quick example to show that despite the Abraham Accords and the billions and billions of dollars spent since Oslo till now to normalize relations, it has not changed much uh, at a public uh, opinion, in fact. Um, now, do we expect internationals to, to apply the same guidelines? So sometimes we get questions from progressive Jewish Americans, actually, I've received two recently. Progressive Jewish Americans saying, um, we have this event and there's this Israeli uh, artist that we wanted to invite, but we wanted to make sure that we're not normalizing. So, you know, I read the email and I laugh and let's say, well, we don't expect any American, let alone Jewish American, to boycott an Israeli artist because of her identity or his identity or their identity. Uh, absolutely not. BDS does not call for identity-based uh, boycotts. Uh, as I said earlier, we target institutions, we target complicity, we don't target individuals, we don't target identity. Uh, that's number one. Number two, normalization as a concept in the BDS movement with a very specific definition applies to Arabs. It does not. Now, Arabs could be living in the US and, and there it gets a bit murky. Uh, what does an Arab American do? you know, uh, she's teaching anthropology at the University of Washington, and she was asked by the university to do a joint project with uh, an Israeli professor from um, Bar-Ilan University. What does she do? Uh, we get into a very murky situation here, because is she American or is she Arab? Well, she's both, but how to deal with this? And, and, and doesn't that endanger issues such as academic freedom? Uh, uh, is there any discrimination involved? We get into very difficult uh, uh, discussions, and I won't discuss it here, but we, we do deal with such gray areas all the time. Uh, and, and we always base it on the ethical principles, the main philosophical foundation for our anti-normalization uh, work. And second, the practical reality on the ground. We're strategic. We're not idealists. We are strategic. We want to achieve Palestinian rights. We don't do this out of a dogma. It's not like written in stone, thou shall boycott. No, we do this simply to achieve Palestinian rights under international law and nothing more. We have no interest in boycotting anyone or anything unless that one or that thing undermines our basic rights and their actions and their statements undermine our basic rights. But again, we do not boycott individuals, we boycott events, we boycott activities, we boycott institutions that are complicit in violating our rights. Even in the worst case uh, uh, situation where this Israeli professor, hypothetically, in that example I gave in the University of Washington, is a bigot. You know, this Israeli professor is a proud Zionist who has spoken in support of the massacre in Gaza in 2014, when more than 500 Palestinian children were murdered. And uh, uh, he or she is on record being you know, have, having horrible uh, uh, justification for war crimes and crimes against humanity. So they're clearly uh, uh, not uh, persons that should be invited to any decent academic event. Then we talk about common sense boycotts. This has nothing to do with normalization. 
This has to do with international guidelines. Uh, this is not exactly a BDS guideline because BDS does not deal with individuals, but it's a common sense boycott. In, in, in other words, if, if you had a bigoted uh, white supremacist American academic uh, who speaks um, about blacks or Latinos or Muslims or Arabs or Jews, whatever the case may be, in, in very racist terms, would a decent conference in, in, in Spain or India invite that person? They shouldn't because they're, they're a bigot. They should not be invited. Well, the same should apply to Israelis. Israelis should not be above that common sense standard. If they're bigots, why invite them? You know, so it's not a BDS, it's not a boycott. It's not a PACB uh, 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 centered boycott. It's a common sense boycott. But it's most important in that, in that case to be morally consistent. Apply the same moral standards, merit standards, ethical standards to everyone, regardless of identity. Don't single out any person based on their identity. So would you invite anyone who's not Israeli with the same bigoted views? And if you say yes, then you yourself are discriminating and you're a bigot yourself. You have to be consistent. No, I would not invite a German, a French, a British academic who has racist views, and I won't invite the Israeli who has racist views, or an Arab who has racist views, a Saudi academic or a Palestinian academic who's bigoted, I should not invite them. So that applies to everyone, then there's no discrimination. So that's very, very important uh, to us. But we certainly do not ask internationals to apply anti-normalization guidelines, except in the general sense that don't organize events that uh, present us as symmetric to Israelis, as on, on par with Israelis. They are oppressors, we are oppressed. Don't try to, to sanitize this relationship of oppression. Help us end oppression, basically. Don't try to make it look nicer. That is our key demand. Of, we, we reject any attempt at this uh, symmetry. One exception to normalization guidelines is uh, debating, debates. So if you're outside the Arab world, obviously, so if you're organizing a debate anywhere outside the Arab world between a, an Arab side and an Israeli side, as long as the, uh, the Israeli side is not an official, uh, and we explain exactly what we mean by official, lest people uh, you know, understand it in, in very extremist ways, we don't consider, for example, uh, an Israeli soldier rather than, uh, you know, not a, a leader of, in the army, a, a soldier or a, a member of the Knesset, Zionist, whatever the case may be. Um, we don't consider them uh, undebatable, we, that we cannot debate with them. No, it's we don't consider it normalization to debate with Israelis, except if they're senior officials in government, in institutions, in re representatives of those institutions, then uh, um, government entities. Uh, then we do not accept to debate them. But otherwise, we do not uh, consider debating per se as normalization, because it's it's a, it's a battle of ideas, and we encourage that battle of ideas. No one can look at a debate and look at it, oh, how nice, they're coexisting. No, they're not coexisting. They're battling it out intellectually. So that's not unethical coexistence, which normalization is. Uh, so that's the one exception we have uh, in our normalization uh, uh, guidelines. I mentioned gray areas before. There's so many gray areas. Most of life is not black and white. Most of life happens between the two uh, in the gray area. Uh, some, sometimes it's a very clear-cut case, but in many cases it's not very clear-cut. And in that case, we advise everyone to ask. Uh, don't assume that you can decide uh, how to interpret BDS guidelines on your own. Uh, that would be appropriation, which is quite inappropriate. Uh, uh, ask those with expertise and with the record who have put those guidelines together, the BNC, PACB. Uh, uh, and we never take any inquiries lightly. We don't uh, give advice based on opinion. Uh, um, let's say uh, my colleague uh, uh, Nada doesn't like uh, X uh, person and, and, and she was asked a question, should we invite X or not? Nada's opinion or Omar's opinion is irrelevant, absolutely irrelevant. All such inquiries go to a collective discussion, and we're very, very methodical in going back to the guidelines. What do the guidelines say? The letter and the spirit of the guidelines, the ethical, uh, uh, between the lines sometimes, the ethical spirit of the guidelines, what do they say in this case? 
And last, if, we, if we're still not sure, does it make sense strategically or not? So sometimes something is boycottable, but we don't launch a boycott against it because it's simply unstrategic. We choose our battles. We don't go out and fight everything that's boycottable. Otherwise, we spread ourselves too thin and we can't win anything. So it's very important to be strategic, not just principled. And, and those who have done any BDS campaigning would know that the BDS movement uh, uh, always seeks this golden balance between uh, ethical principles and strategic effectiveness. We've got to be both ethical and strategic. We can't be just ethical and forget about being strategic and goal-oriented, and we cannot be opportunist and just be goal-oriented without looking at our principles. We've got to do both. And this, this uh, tension between the two is not always easy to navigate, but navigate we must. We have no choice but to navigate that to make sure that we reach this uh, golden balance. So I'll stop here, and I hope we can discuss more in, in the Q&A period. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for a very detailed um, and careful presentation, Omar, as you normally do. And uh, people will note that um, how basically how liberal um, the Palestinian BDS campaign is. Um, it is um, much more open-minded uh, than other campaigns before it, like in South Africa. And I hope that people um, take this um, to their hearts and, and appreciate that. Uh, I now uh, wish to introduce the second speaker. Tali Shapiro is a feminist, queer, vegan activist in the Israeli group Boycott From Within. She's been active in local and international solidarity group, Anarchists Against the Wall, and the International Solidarity Movement. She focuses on cultural boycott campaigns of Israel and researches how Israel's cultural industry normalizes and profits from Israel's colonialism. Her latest project contextualizes Israel's colonialism within the framework of the crime of genocide against the indigenous Palestinian people. Please, Tali, it's yours. Thank you, Chaim. Um, you know, Omar is, um, is such an informative and inspirational speaker. I find myself asking what I could possibly add. I also ask myself as a member of the colonial class, is it my place to add anything? But if I'm silent, Am I being complicit? It's from this dilemma that I choose to speak out against my government's colonial apartheid policies every day. Those of us registered by the State of Israel as Jews access the rights, benefits, and privileges that this status awards. And while I can't shed my colonial privileges, believe me, I tried, I can leverage those privileges as resources for the benefit of the indigenous Palestinian anti-colonial struggle. We Israelis didn't invent this idea, of course. Uh, first and foremost, as Omar already told us, we were invited to take up this challenge by Palestinian civil society when it published its BDS call in 2005. Uh, we were also inspired by a long and proud tradition of Jewish anarchists, socialists, feminists, and internationalists who struggled for their own liberation for many generations and joined the struggles of others from uh, the civil rights movements in the United States to the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa to the BDS movement in Palestine, where we have a profound obligation to end our own supremacy over another people. I, I want to repeat that because as I say these words, I find myself terrified at the implications. We, I, have supremacy over another people. I remember a conversation I had once at a a party hosted by a Palestinian friend with a small group of activists from the United States. I tried to explain this concept to them and what came out was that I pointed at my dear beloved friend and said, I was raised to pick up a rifle and shoot Samira in the head and think nothing of it. This dehumanizing sadism is at the heart of any statement uttered in defense of Israel's actions and policies. 
from the ethnic cleansing of its foundations to the street execution of children that it's been committing at an average rate of every four days since the start of 2023. All in all, Israel has executed a Palestinian every 21 hours on average since the beginning of this year. And the lawmakers who legalize it and the courts who judicialize it and the generals who plan it and the soldiers who execute it think nothing of it. It's normal. Israeli news outlets, more often than not, don't even bother making excuses for it. They just don't mention it. So when we talk about anti-normalization, it's not an intellectual exercise. People, families, children, parents with lives, dreams, hopes, and aspirations, just like each and every one of you, their lives are at the end of every action we take when Israel is in question. There is no way to disentangle a colonized people from the regime that has propped itself on top of them. Any policy, any action, any transaction that Israel makes, academic, cultural, economic, is at the expense of Palestinian lives and existence as a people. Because the colonial goal is the elimination of the indigenous identity so that the colonists may claim the place and its history. And by erasing the people, erasing the sin of their erasure. This of course is an oxymoron, but logic never stopped genocide, sanctions do. And that is what anti-normalization as, as put forth by the BDS movement is all about, moving accountability from theory to practice. As an Israeli, if I'm to add anything of value to what the co-founder of this global movement has to say, it's two words, boycott Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Tali, for um, a very clear and concise message from the Israeli organizations supporting the boycott and supporting the struggle against normalization. Um, you may, of course, switch your cameras on uh, for the QA, but please stay muted. Um, a number of people have asked questions on the chat, and because um, Nira Yuval Davis um, needs to leave. Um, I invite you, Nira, to ask your question first, if you are still there. Yes, I'm still there. Chaim, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Omar, for your brilliant speech. And um, I think it's brilliant not only because of the general message that you've given, but also because of your specific contribution in what I consider a very important political and ethical struggle against identity politics, which is splitting the left, I think, globally. And, and I think it's very uh, important. Uh, the question I wanted to ask, uh, which you did not mention, but as you know, more and more organizations and states are legislating against any support of the BDS as a form of anti-Semitism. As, an, as a long time anti-Zionist Israeli uh, diasporic Jew, uh, who has been active against both racism and anti-Semitism, I would like to hear your response and your observation about this weapon of legislation against support of BDS as a form of anti-Semitism. Thanks. Uh, hi, are we taking a few questions or shall I answer? Um, um, please ask, answer now because Nira asked okay. uh, because she's got to leave. Okay, uh, thanks Nira for this uh, question. It's, it's beyond the scope of uh, the discussion today. Um, it, it's more related to the so-called IHRA definition and how it's been uh, weaponizing smears of anti-Semitism uh, to shut down advocacy of Palestinian rights. Um, and as a byproduct, I think an intentional byproduct, uh, it is also undermining the struggle against real anti-Jewish uh, 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 racism and hate. Uh, uh, because if, if anti-Semitism is appropriated by Israel, anti-Israel becomes anti-Semitism, then they're throwing Jewish communities under the bus, basically. Then you, when, you, when anti-Semitism, real anti-Semitism hits you on the head, you cannot see it. Uh, because everything becomes anti-Semitic. 
if, uh, our Jewish Israeli partners in Germany who support BDS are anti-Semites. And it's white supremacist uh, Germans calling them anti-Semites, which is really strange. But anyway, uh, the BDS movement um, from the start has adopted very clear anti-racist positions. And then we developed a reference document on, on our anti-racist positions, which says we're opposed to all forms of racism and discrimination, uh, be it uh, Islamophobia, anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous, sexism, anti-LGBT discrimination, and so on, and anti-Semitism. So it's very, very explicitly laid out uh, there. The problem with IHRA is that it is uh, this revisionist fraudulent definition is destroying what common sense uh, says about how to fight anti-Jewish hate, bigotry, racism, and discrimination. It has very little to do with that from the definition itself, which is a weird, very unintellectual definition, to the examples. Seven of 11 examples are Israel-related. Uh, if you call for a boycott of Israel, if you say Israel is an apartheid state, and so on and so forth, you're an anti-Semite which makes many, many, many Jewish intellectuals, academics, artists, anti-Semites, uh, uh, and while white supremacists are left off the hook. So in a country like Germany, one of the most horrible places for doing Palestine activism, if not the most horrible place outside of Palestine, Israel, uh, uh, um, in Germany, over 90% of anti-Jewish attacks are done by white supremacists, according to German police reports, yet the culprits are BDS. And, you know, those black and brown communities and Muslims, of course, were always the devil. But those white supremacists that are present in parliament are off the hook. This is why the biggest response to the Bundestag, to the German lower house of parliament decision to consider BDS anti-Semitic, which was a statement, it's not a, it's not a law. The first response before we even posted our response as BDS movement came from over 240 Jewish intellectuals and academics, including many, many Zionists and including the top uh, references, the top authoritative voices in the studies against anti-Semitism, in the studies of the Holocaust and so on, uh, who were extremely alarmed by the Bundestag decision because they can see the writing on the wall. This is Germany we're talking about. When the Germans start blaming others for their sins, you know something is deeply, deeply wrong. And that's what's happening in the United States. Uh, Trump and white supremacists and, and evangelical Christian Zionists, the most horrible anti-Semites on earth that are waiting for Jesus to come to convert all Jews or kill them all, they're Israel's best friends. So Israel is making friends with the anti-Semites of the world while attacking the BDS movement. The last point I want to say very quickly is that the anti-BDS legislation across the US and increasingly in the UK and elsewhere is being used as a template for suppressing other justice movements women's rights movements, especially reproductive rights movements, uh, uh, black and brown people's voting rights, the anti-fossil fuels, the climate justice movement, the anti-gun movement, all these movements are being targeted by the exact same legislation. They just take out BDS and Palestinians and they replace it with fossil fuels, women's rights, whatever the case may be. And it's the template being used. So what, what I personally have said in my tours in the US 2015, 2016, Everyone, every liberal, forget progressives, every liberal should be very concerned about anti-BDS legislation because it's anti-democratic, it's McCarthyite. If you don't fight it now, they will come for you. They will go after your justice movement, just like the first McCarthyism iteration did not just end with the communists or with Jewish dissident. It went after everyone disagreeing with, with the government. Sorry, this took a bit too long, but I, I tried to give some context. Thank you, Omar. Um, Tali, would you like to add um, your um, words to uh, Omar's? Um, yeah, just a one point to make uh, as, as uh, fr from a point of view of, of uh, a guerrilla activist, uh, which is kind of my framework, um, that a lot of people have been saying about the IJRA that uh, it's taking away attention from from the struggle but but to me this is part of the political process like of course the ihra will come along and, and all kinds of legislations again against speaking about uh israel's war crimes be, because because they have to fight us in some way or form and we have to fight that that's the 
uh, that's the stage we're in of this historical process. So, um, so in that sense, um, to to recon recontextualize it for us, not as a um, as something that takes away the attention from from the real struggle, but this is part of it, and and that's how we always we can use it to always talk about Palestine. Thank you very much, Tali. And now um, the questions are coming thick and fast um, into the chat. And I'll need to be very careful to uh, get people in the order that they asked. Um, can I ask John Hall um, to ask your question? Because I'm not sure that I fully understand it and I don't want to misrepresent you. Can you ask your question, John? Thank you, Haim. Um, basically, I'm concerned about Christian Zionism, um, particularly in this stage, but also Brazil and other countries of South America and elsewhere. It, we, we can think of Israeli oppression as ethnic cleansing, um, particularly in Palestinian Zion. Israeli Zionists want Zion, Zion to themselves, and Christian Zionists, an event evangelicals in the USA and elsewhere want Jews again to colonize Zion in order to fulfill a biblical prophecy paving the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. The role of Christian Zionism and evangelism, particularly in the USA, needs recognizing as part of Israeli oppression. Uh, have you any thoughts on this? And this demonstrates that the USA cannot be a, an honest broker in any peace process. I will also ask Blake Olcott to ask his question now. So we'll keep um, questions in, in bunches of two or three. Blake. Thanks to all three for this great event and uh, for the clear statements from Tali and, and Omar. I had two questions, but the one that's most important to me is I had something to do with the journal Citizenship Studies recently. I submitted something. And then all of a sudden I thought, is this a gray area? Because I noticed that on the Board of Advisors, there were <clears throat> Guy Ben Porat from Ben Gurdian University in, in Israel, Gal Levy from the Open University in Israel, and Yoav Peled from Tel Aviv University. And I thought, well, uh, are these government entities, which is a concept that you used, Omar, uh, are they representing these entities? Uh, what to do in a case like this? Should we submit anything? Should one submit anything uh, to such a journal? So on the first question from John, I, I just want to make a very important distinction here between uh, evangelicals in general and Christian Zionists specifically. Evangelicals, especially in the US, is a is an enormous uh, group. 80 to 100 million Americans identify as evangelicals. They're not all Zionists by any means. Uh, Christian Zionists are a minority among them, huge, but but millions. But I mean, they're not in the tens of millions. So, so we need to make that distinction. Otherwise, it becomes scary. If 100 million <laughs> become Zionists in the US, uh, out of uh, Armageddon-centered uh, ideologies, we're um, screwed. Um, but but uh, in any case, many evangelical uh, partners who work in evangelical churches are working day and night to uh, uh, convince people not to adopt those false prophecies, those false interpretations of the Bible. Uh, uh, and they work very hard to say how this is uh, actually uh, um, justifying genocide, justifying ethnic cleansing and genocide. They would actually support genocide against first Palestinians, obviously, because we're the obstacle to having a fully Jewish state that will make the Messiah return. And then when the Messiah returns, there will be genocide against those, Jew those Jews who don't convert. If they don't accept Jesus, they're finished. They, you know, they burn in hell forever. So it's gen two genocides, basically, against the Palestinians and against Jews who don't convert. Uh, and they're Israel's best friends. 
No, no. Uh, one of the Israeli ministers, Dermer, who's one of the closest to Netanyahu, who was the ambassador, Israeli ambassador to the U.S., uh, uh, recently repeated that uh, uh, Christian Zionists are our best ally in the U.S. Because, you know, those Jews are too problematic in the U.S. Every one of them has so many opinions and they're so entitled and they tell Israel what it should do and should not do just because they give us all this money. You know, they, they want to control us. Those Jews are very problematic. But those Christian Zionists ask no questions. The money pours in, they support settlements, they support war crimes, absolutely no questions asked. So imagine the level that Israel has reached with this far, far, far right extremist government with its fascist elements that it is supporting those uh, people. So that's a danger uh, really to, to everyone involved. On the issue of, of um, um, citizenship uh, studies, it's very important, uh, Blake, to make a distinction between mere affiliation versus representation. And this is in the academic boycott guidelines. Basically what we say is that an Israeli professor uh, who happens to be affiliated to a university, Israeli university, all Israeli universities are complicit in the system of oppression. We have good research, which will be published soon, that shows all of them are deeply, deeply complicit. I mean, they're a pillar in the system of apartheid and settler colonialism. But a, a professor affiliated is not representative of the institution. And that is the, the general guideline that applies. So no, we don't call for boycotting something simply because an Israeli professor is on it. Now, if this is not simply an Israeli professor, but let's say a, a vice chancellor, president, dean, you know, someone with authority, with an official status that's much higher, then they are definitely representative. They're no longer individuals. They're representative of the institution. And then we would call for a boycott because that's not an individual, that's an institutional uh, uh, representation uh, uh, issue. Now with academic journals, it gets tricky because on the editorial board, you always have uh, uh, the possibility of having an Israeli, obviously affiliated with an Israeli university. Uh, uh, what to do in that case? Again, we don't call for a boycott if it's just mere affiliation, not representation. We don't call uh, uh, for, for a boycott in, in, in that case. We would have a problem if the journal is based at an Israeli university, or is sponsored, funded, and there are some journals that are based in Israeli universities, we call for a complete boycott of those journals. But otherwise, we don't. Ali, uh, do you have any points to make? Right. Uh, Sue Blackwell, please ask your question. Unmute it, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, yes, it's also related to the academic boycotts, um, um, but, but in this case about European funding, EU funding, where Israel has long been treated as an honorary uh, EU member state or candidate member state, just, just as in sport and, and the Eurovision Song Contest and all the rest of it. Um, so Israeli universities often take part in, in projects, uh, multinational, international projects that get EU funding. Um, what is the status of Palestinian universities regarding such applications? Can they also apply in the way that Israeli universities can? I think I know what the answer is going to be. Um, and if they do try to take part in an international project, is it the case, I suspect it is, that they are expected to partner up with an Israeli university um, in order to get funding? I, a bit of balance, you know? Um, whereas, of course, Israeli universities are not required to find a Palestinian partner if they want to get funding. Are there any circumstances in which Western academics, like myself, should agree to participate and joint international project which includes an Israeli institutional partner. So I'm, I'm talking now not about individuals, but yeah, people who are representing um, an Israeli university. Thank you. And there is another question from Egbert. Uh, would you ask your question now, Egbert? Yeah, sure. I uh, would like to hear from Omar uh, a little bit more about the background of the difference in boycott approach in the, the old South African apartheid case and uh, the Palestinian case now, uh, nowadays, the BDS approach in the Palestinian BDS approach regarding uh, individuals of the, uh, of the oppressive uh, society. Uh, first, uh, uh, Sue's question, a quick answer is no. There is no um, possibility of participating in any project, any project whatsoever, 
involving an Israeli university, uh, and this project become is not boycottable. All such projects are boycottable. Any project in the world, no matter who's doing what, whether it's an individual working with an Israeli university or an institution working with an Israeli university, any relationship to an Israeli university is boycottable as an institution, because all Israeli institutions for decades have been a pillar, a foundation of the system of apartheid and settler colonialism. So there is no way, no matter what partners they bring in, uh, uh, um, uh, University of Johannesburg at one point before cutting relations with uh, Ben Gurion University tried to find a Palestinian partner, some Palestinian institution to, to have a three way partnership, basically. Of course, no Palestinian university agreed. Uh, all Palestinian universities respect the guidelines. Uh, they don't adopt BDS, they can't because they would lose funding, but they respect the guidelines. <clears throat> they don't, they accept the anti normalization uh, guidelines. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> And therefore, they couldn't find a Palestinian partner. In fact, all of them wrote to University of Johannesburg, you should cut off relations with Ben Gurion until the day comes when Ben Gurion University is no longer part of the system of oppression and where it is not racist and where it does not discriminate against Palestinian students and it doesn't uh, uh, expand on, on land expropriated from Bedouin Palestinians and so on and so forth. And there are a thousand reasons why you should boycott Ben Gurion University, one of the most liberal universities in Israel. So there's no way to have a relationship that's not boycottable with an Israeli university as an institution. On Egbert's uh, question, uh, where that difference came from, as I said, several of us have been involved in the South African, had been involved in the South African anti-apartheid uh, uh, movement. And then we did implement a boycott against everyone and everything South African. Now, when we started, and again, this is a collective effort, when we started developing the guidelines for the BDS movement, um, we thought of this issue of individual versus institution, and we thought that this is a very identity-based boycott, which may have been okay in the 70s and 60s, you know, politics develops, evolves. Uh, we don't want to make our movement based on identity. We really want to target complicity. Uh, um, so it comes from this understanding, this, this uh, uh, perspective, that our problem is not with the human who's oppressing us. Our problem is with the oppression system that makes that human an oppressor. So if the human becomes not an oppressor, as, as Tali was saying, we have no problem with the human. I have no problem with Tali, she's my partner in the struggle. So her being Jewish Israeli is not, does not concern me per se. Uh, because she fully supports our rights and she's with us resisting uh, the system of oppression. So her identity is irrelevant, becomes irrelevant. She neutralizes the harm done from her identity as part of the oppressor community by co-resisting. So, th so there's no, we, we, we don't put identity as a priority in that sense. It's that complicity issue that's first and foremost. Dali, do you want to comment any further? I think just to add, uh, to dovetail on, on what Omar just said, um, in, specifically for Israelis, I see a lot of us on the call. So, so I want to, to add this uh, from that it, it is our responsibility to, to, to nullify the identity. It's, it's, it's our responsibility to act in solidarity um, in order for that trust to be built. So, so first we take that step, then trust is built. I just wanted to add uh, as chair that many of us uh, see um, with uh, satisfaction Israelis uh, in the hundreds of thousands going into the streets against their government. But um, remember what Tali said, uh, actually most of those Israelis are Zionists and not only Zionists, but they think they are the real Zionists. And most of them are very little concerned to put it mildly about Palestinian rights about the oppression, about the occupation, about the apartheid, about everything that happens as we speak. Every day, Palestinians are killed 
and nobody has been brought to justice. So uh, the question of identity have to be looked at very carefully. Uh, and uh, those people uh, who are against the government, quite right, uh, rightly against this government, uh, are not necessarily um, our partners in our struggle for Palestinian rights and for Palestinian equality and for Palestinian identity being recognized uh, because they have not changed yet. Now, sometimes it's possible that the struggle itself educates people. That's a Marxist view and uh, there are examples of this. Let's see if some of them move to the anti-Zionist pro-Palestinian side until they do that their identity is against um, the struggle. Uh, the next person I see here um, is Sarah Sturge. Could you please ask your questions? Um, Sarah? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good, thank you. Um, yes, I'm here from London in the UK. Um, I think my question is not quite so much about boycott as normalization. And specifically in the UK, we have the Stand Up to Racism organization, which is known as marching with uh, welcoming Zionist uh, supporters carrying Israeli flags and also silencing opposition to this and criticism of Israel. Now, um, I'm increasingly in opposition to this. I would suppose I, because what they do is, um, I think, hearing about normalization, I think you could call it normalize, normalization. Um, and I would, um, I'm proposing boycotting. I don't feel I can be part of it. At the same time, they organize against anti racism, so it's quite a difficult thing to oppose. And I'm just wondering uh, what people's thoughts are on this and any advice about this. Yes, I don't know the organization uh, well enough to, to understand the context. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to comment really on it without knowing uh, the details. Uh, but uh, in a hypothetical situation where an organization anywhere opposed to racism yet has no problem uh, allowing a contingent flying the flag of a settler colony, uh, an apartheid system that is one of the worst forms of racism, there's a clear contradiction there. But rather than boycotting as a first reaction, we would advise um, pressure from within to correct the path, if, if it's possible. Yeah, uh, they silence that. They, they remove you if you try to do that. Yeah, this is becoming a very British thing, removing people you disagree with, from the Labour Party to, <laughs> uh, to the Conservatives everywhere. It's unbelievable for a democratic society to, to cancel so many dissidents just because of uh, having a different views. Well, if it's impossible to change its path, then uh, I guess struggling to change uh, the leadership. In many of those organizations, uh, you know, those dominant uh, forces are not necessarily the most committed, principled, anti-racist uh, people. And again, I don't know this organization, but I'm, I'm talking about in general. Look at the climate justice movement. It was so lily white 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and it had a very white agenda, uh, uh, white capital W uh, agenda, very colonial agenda. Um, and now, with much more participation of people of color, indigenous communities, uh, island communities, and so on, look how it's shifting to a much more progressive intersectional uh, agenda, which is a, a much better thing. So sometimes changing, uh, changing organizations from within is very difficult, takes a lot of time. But ultimately, if it's a really good organization, it would be, um, it would be a shame to just you know, boycott it and, and do nothing about it, rather than try to salvage it, find creative ways, big coalition building to salvage this, if it's possible. Yeah, I'm trying to get the trade union movement involved in putting pressure on. So that's, I suppose, what you're wanting or suggesting. Uh, yeah, very quickly, this government really helps. 
uh, this uh, far-right government with its fascist elements, with ministers calling for genocide, wiping out Palestinian villages, uh, I, uh, one, one of them saying, uh, I'm a proud homophobe, I'm a proud fascist. You know, they're giving us all the fuel we need for this fire, basically. Uh, but it make, it, opportunities alone do not uh, uh, change anything. It's human agency that changes things. Opportunities are opportunities, but let's use them. Now it will be much easier to say that the Israeli flag, flying an Israeli flag, is an offense. It's a racist, anti-Palestinian offense that should not be allowed. Because as long as this country is a settler colony and an apartheid system, flying its flag in an anti-racist platform is not just an oxymoron, it's racist, it's anti-Palestinian. Tali, you want to say something about this? I, I, I mean, every word Omar said, first and foremost, uh, I think um, the, the way I think about these things, it, it really does depend on uh, the size of the organization and, and your belonging in the organization. And uh, if, if you're silenced from within, then you are, uh, quote unquote, no longer part of the community. So you come from without. So, so yeah, definitely any coalition that you can build and and the the idea of whether you boycott or call out or whatever it is whatever course of action you choose to do is that you don't do it quietly okay i'm not talking to you anymore because that's ineffective but rather um make it public T talk about it in public call them out in public so they have to respond it, it a it makes a campaign the, this kind of back and forth and also it's um it's the way we create uh, a, a more, um, you know, a less racist culture, right? If, if we hear something racist, then we say something about it, then already the culture is less racist because we can hear anti-racist voices. So to, to me, that would be, again, it, it, it depends on your particular context, what you might want to do, what steps ABC you want might, you might want to take, but, um, but definitely do it loudly, whatever it is you're planning to do. Okay, thank you. Sarah, there is um, another uh, person, uh, Michael Kalmanovitz uh, from IJAN, who is saying to you, thanks for raising stand up to racism because it is not standing up to Israeli apartheid. So this is something for you and others um, who are supporting Palestine and um, supporting our struggle against Zionism to raise within uh, the organization if you're members and to uh, indeed change its policy with the current um, leadership or without them. Um, the next person who um, wants to ask a question did not supply a name apart from Red Sea. Um, would you like to ask your question, Red Sea? Uh, yes, my brother. Um, I was listening to the comment on identity politics. And um, I think it is an important issue. It is not to nullify the identity I would suggest. I would think that Maybe a better way to put it is in a way that Gayatri Spivak might have put it when she would argue for taking responsibility for one's privilege. And in this regard, there is a hierarchy of privilege between the river and the sea. And therefore, a, it, is, it is very good that there are a number of Jewish Israelis on the call. And the issue is if one looks at the demonstrations, then one sees that the very things at the heart of this program are not in the demonstrations. And that is the issue where taking responsibility for privilege comes in, where the issue of equality in Israel the ending of the occupation, the right of return, as well as the cultural and economic boycott must become issues of everyday struggle inside of Israel. And that is the task that I might suggest, taking responsibility for relative privilege 
comes in because not only must those issues be taken to the street, they must be taken to the dinner tables where Jewish Israelis must face the consequences of Zionism because it is a Jewish value. It is a value of the prophets of Jerusalem that to kill an innocent person is the equivalent to killing the whole of humanity. It is that exaggerated, that fundamental, uh, 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 because I am taking, maybe raising a concern, one talking about nullifying Jewish identity, it can be read in a very catastrophic way, even if the intention is not that. Thanks. Uh, I got one more question, which might be the last one, because we are um, coming to the hour and a half. Um, Gil Mualem Doron, can you ask your question? Uh, yeah, sorry, um, my uh, internet is not stable, so I uh, won't uh, operate the video. Um, it's very specific, so... Um, um, what are your opinions, and I'm asking uh, both Omar and Tali, about uh, Jewish Israelis or Palestinian within 48 borders, um, artists to produce socially and politically engaged art, so it's not commercial, it's dependent on state funding, um, and you know, produce and would like to show it in, in Israel, but as you know, most of the, most of the, um, uh, places are state funded. What, what they supposed to do in that case? You're talking about artists, uh, whether Jewish, Israeli, or Palestinians from Forty Eight, who are trying to show their work within the state. Yes, within oh, within okay. within Israel. Um, okay. Okay. And they can't support themselves commercially because it's okay. political or social work. Okay. So so I'll go after uh, Tali. Did you want to comment on the first uh, point uh, or? Yes, yes. Uh, so just to, to clarify, I, as far as I understood the question, it was a US for clarification, Red Sea. Um, I was, when I said nullify, I was um, referring to, um, to the, uh, not to Jewish identity. <laughs> I was referring particularly to, to, the, to the privileges. So, so the the if we as I said, we we can't shed our privileges. They are there, and uh, we we can try. We can really try. We can, for example, a true story, run in front of a demonstration in the West Bank, and still the Palestinian behind me will get arrested, and I will not. So you can try. I had a friend who tried to stay imprisoned as long as the Palestinian who was arrested with her. Um, is arrested and they just wouldn't hold her. They they released her and, and the Palestinian was held for the next three months, I believe. Uh, so, so we can really try to shed the privileges. It just, they won't let us, they don't want us to. Um, but definitely not the uh, the Jewish identity. That's for uh, every, uh, every person with faith to deal with internally. I think it has nothing to do with what we're discussing, definitely. Uh, and also in terms of um, uh, bringing it to the streets, I, I, <laughs> if we could, then we wouldn't be supportive of BDS. If, if we could uh, create a, a, you know, a widespread anti-apartheid movement in Israel, then we wouldn't need BDS because Israelis would be out in the streets, uh, you know, half a million of them um, besieging Sarah Netanyahu at the barber shop in Tel Aviv uh, would be doing that because of what happened in, in uh, Huara. Th that would be wonderful, but it doesn't happen that way because we simply don't have that support. Uh, if we did, there would be no occupation, there would be no colonialism. Okay, uh, on the question from Gil uh, about artists, uh, Israeli citizens, whether Palestinian, uh, 48 Palestinian or Jewish Israeli uh, citizens, uh, artists who want to show their work uh, um, in Israeli venues, um, in the 
guidelines, BDS guidelines for the academic and cultural boycott deal, we talk very openly about this issue. And in the 1948 guidelines, which are different, by the way, uh, normalization guidelines, the only community where there are different guidelines on normalization is the Palestinians in, in 48. Uh, because of their reality, uh, uh, there's a coercive kind of relationship that they must deal with to steadfast to 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 uh, remain uh, on their land. But going back to your question, uh, we distinguish between entitlement as taxpayers uh, and conditional funding. So, and uh, a citizen of Israel who's an artist uh, who pays taxes is entitled to uh, several services from the state. It's an apartheid state. Fine. But you're entitled to several services, educational, health services, cultural services, uh, funding from the cinema fund, and so on and so forth. So this kind of uh, thing is an entitlement uh, for citizens. It's not a privilege. And every citizen should use their entitlement from the state, uh, health, culture, uh, and so on. So let's take the most difficult example. Forget Jewish Israeli uh, filmmakers. Let's say a Palestinian, 48 Palestinian filmmaker, artist, who wants to show their work. Uh, first, they want to produce their work before showing it. So let's take the tougher question. They want to produce their work, film or exhibit or whatever the case may be. Uh, should they apply for state funding or not? I mean, there are cultural funds in Israel. Should they apply or not? Uh, the only condition we have is that the funding has to be non-conditional, unconditional politically, no strings attached. Uh, what do we mean? Let's take the cinema fund, for example, in Israel. Until now, it is still not conditional, although it's very heavily implicitly conditional, but it's not yet conditional. Uh, um, so there's a lot of self-censorship. Uh, those who are applying know that if they have a radical, quote unquote, radical by Israeli standards, which means right wing by international standards, uh, if you're radical, the culture ministry will might you know object, uh, but it's actually not the ministry that decides. There are some professions until now who, based on merit, decide to give you funding or not. But of course, it's very politicized. But there's no written condition that you have to be a Zionist, you have to praise the state of Israel. Uh, there is no condition. But there is a Rabinovich Foundation, for example. Its funding is conditional. Uh, uh, if you accept money from Rabinovich, you have to uh, sign a statement saying you shall do the, it's a loyalty oath, basically. So that we call for a boycott. Of, of any conditional funding, we call for a boycott. There is no entitlement to so conditional funding. You've got to boycott. Even if, if you think there's no other way, you've got to find another way because that harms our struggle for our basic rights. So that's for producing the art. Exhibiting, the same thing applies. Exhibiting at a state venue, well, that's you have no choice. So the philosophical basis for this is that is the relationship coercive or voluntary? Am I coerced? I have no choice? Or is it voluntary? In normalization, that is the question we ask. So let's say sometimes we get questions, you know, my mother is sick and there's no hospital in Nablus that can treat her case. Is it okay to take her to Hadassah in, in occupied Jerusalem? And we say, of course, of course. First of all, life trumps everything. And second, this is a coercive relationship. You have no choice but to go to an Israeli hospital, just like workers have no choice but to get a permit from the Israeli occupying authorities to work in Israeli project, and so on and so forth. So coercive relationships trump any uh, uh, BDS guideline, basically. If you have no choice to live, to survive, except to do this, you've got to do it, uh, BDS or not. That, uh, life comes first. So, so our ethical standards are very, very clear in, in that sense. So you have no choice as an artist to, to uh, exhibit or not to exhibit at a state venue, you have to. But I wouldn't exhibit at a private venue that is racist. That's different, you don't have to. Choose a state venue. I mean, the, state, the entire state is an apartheid state, but it's a state venue, you're entitled to it. So believe it or not, we prefer that you exhibit at a state venue than a private venue that's anti-Palestinian, that's racist, that supports apartheid and so on. Uh, because the state venue is your entitlement as a as a taxpayer, you have no choice but to use the government, the public uh, uh, venues. Basically, I hope that's clear. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Tali. Do you want to add? I'd like that, um, Gil. Uh, I think apart from the BDS guidelines, which should be the you know the basis from which we start to think about these things. I think there are several other layers uh, as Israelis that we should be thinking about. Um, 
and when we decide to do these types of projects, what, what message are we sending? Are, are we truly clear about the opposition to, to apartheid Israel? Are we, are we truly clear about uh, our Palestinian partners and us? We are not the same. We are not equals in this. We are of the oppressor class. They are of the oppressed class. Are those things clear? through the project uh, or even in the written material, or are we just uh, you know, doing art for the sake of art and uh, looking peaceful while doing it while children are shot in the streets? So, so apart from the BDS guidelines, on top of it, I think as Israelis, we have a special responsibility to, to really think about, you know, I'm an artist too. So you want to think about what the message of your art is. Uh, and that includes the politics of it, especially since you're going out of your way, because this doesn't come natural in Israel, you're going out of your way to work with Palestinians, then then you want to think about what, what message are we delivering? Uh, I also wanted to add, um, Gil, that um, from the noises we heard from this current government, um, you will not have a long time before it will be clear that people like yourself, myself, and many other filmmakers and artists who support Palestinian rights have nothing to look for in the Israeli state funds because uh, they are going, yeah, go on. Uh, I was fired from Mahon Avni and I was getting death threats from one of the trustees of Tel Aviv Museum of Art. I left Israel 20 years ago. So, you know, obviously um, people, artists that live in Israel uh, are also getting death threats like us. Um, and um, they have to think about death threats slightly different uh, if they live in Israel, if they are Palestinians especially. Uh, so I think the, the question will, uh, is it's, it's an important question you ask, but uh, reality is likely to answer it um, in a nasty way in the um, near future. I think I will invite the last question from Blake Olcott, and then we will uh, have to uh, close. Yeah, we're running over. So the real short form is, maybe I misunderstood you, Omar, at the beginning that political parties had supported the call. And I wondered if Fatah and Hamas supported it or do support it. Of course, this is probably a big question about you know, other powerful Palestinian forces, how they stand to BDS. But... Uh, uh, yes, all Palestinian political parties have supported it all of them. Now, in the BDS National Committee, the coalition that leads the global BDS movement, we don't have any single political party by design, because we, and all political parties understand that, we have a coalition of parties uh, um, that is one member of this BNC, the BDS National Committee. Why by design? Because we don't want to give our enemies the opportunity to say, oh, you have this party or that party that is on this list or that list, then the whole BDS movement is guilty by association and they'll shut us down. So by design, and all political parties agree, they distance themselves enough to give us the safety and autonomy that we need to work globally. And indeed, no political party can twist our arms or tell us what to do. We're very powerful because we have massive support among Palestinians. We criticize the president and we criticize the prime minister. We criticize everyone in the PA and in Hamas. And in fact, we criticize anyone uh, if they violate BDS guidelines. And we're not scared of anyone because we are a massive, massive coalition uh, uh, that doesn't uh, bow to any pressure or any ideological uh, tendency. Thanks. And, and if we're closing, Haim, I just wanted to comment, which has nothing to do with normalization, but because I have not said anything about the hundreds of thousands of Israelis uh, um, uh, protesting uh, the government and the time, the number of times they use fascist, it's unbelievable. In the last couple of months, I've never seen the F word being used so much in the Israeli media. It's unbelievable. But anyway, uh, uh, I wanted to say that, of course, it will be an extremely difficult period for Palestinians, as we're saying, as we're seeing from Hawara onwards. It's the first time that uh, Israeli ministers openly openly support genocide. 
I mean, all of them do, from the most liberal who have committed acts that can qualify as possibly genocide, Rabin and Paris, you know, the peaceniks, much better than, much, Ben Gvir is much better than them. He has not yet committed any acts of massive ethnic cleansing. Rabin and Paris have. Uh, so all of them agree. But now we have ministers openly saying things that everyone had hidden before. I think this is an unprecedented opportunity in 74 years. Unprecedented opportunity, honestly. Uh, uh, it is not every day that you have a government that makes life much easier for the resistance, for us. It is much easier. The, we're pushing doors and the doors are opening for us in the last couple of months, much more than in the last 20, 15 years, I would say. And I, I'll stop here. I think, Tali, you might want to say something about this as well. And honestly, it's, um, I mean, we, it's hard to say we didn't see it coming because we've been watching the, the rise of uh, the Israeli alt-right, let's call them whatever the hell that means on the spectrum where everybody's fascist to extra fascist. But um, we, we've been watching this, the, the rise of Ben Gvir. We saw it coming. And interestingly, I, I'm talking to my parents and they're surprised. They don't know how this happened. And uh, it, it kind of... Um, there was this poem, I'm sure other people could, uh, it's kind of ridiculous, I don't remember who wrote it. Um, it was written about the Holocaust when they, and they said, when they took the Jews, I didn't do anything. And when they took the communists, I didn't do anything. And then they came and they took me. Well, you know, now here they are at our doors, uh, as it were. So uh, the um, privileged class is, is feeling uh, the pressure all of a sudden. So now it's coming out. Um, and I, I can't re reiterate enough how much this is uh, if from within the Israeli public, this is not going to do anything for Palestinians uh, if they manage and they won't to stop uh, the, this, uh, the judicial coup, as they call it. Um, then, then everybody will go back to normal now because they won't. We don't know what happens next, but I, I, I honestly don't see Israelis escalating, but we, we will have to wait and see. Uh, but in terms of uh, what Omar said, uh, finally, uh, yeah, the, the, the Israeli media is full of the word fascism. Uh, also, I'll say that uh, what I've seen, uh, which changed within literally a month and a half uh, from my first visit uh, to my parents' house to the second one where we all watched the news together, um, two months ago, Nobody understood the problem with what they were trying to do to the courts. Um, it, 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 they had to bring in some experts. Uh, the, the media brought in judicial experts to explain that if you do that to the courts, uh, th then it is no longer a, a democracy, despite the fact that Israel was, it was only a democracy on paper. But if, if you take away the, the judicial uh, um, pillar, you, you no longer have a, a democracy by definition. Um, a month and a half later, we're watching the news and it's common knowledge. Everybody's talking about it. They don't have to bring in an expert. Everybody's saying it. And it's, it's a mainstream opinion that what is happening in Israel is uh, it's, uh, the, the death of democracy or something. Um, what happens next is critical. As Omar is saying, this is an opportunity. It is critical for us to, every time something terrible happens in Israel, uh, whether bombing in Gaza, which is the most dramatic, or uh, what happened in Hawara now, or the judicial coup itself, it, it's also a very dramatic thing. Every time something bad happens, that it's, uh, we have to seize that as an opportunity. It's, it's a tragedy, and we have to seize it as an opportunity to do the work that we do. Thank you very, very much uh, to both of you. Um, I want to, uh, to remind people of the poem that um, Tali has uh, related to. This is a poem by Pastor Neumuller, and um, by um, keying that name, you will find the poem uh, within a second, because it's one of the best known poems on this earth. I also want to um, relate to what um, you both said very briefly before we close. Um, in the 80s, uh, a famous professor in Israel has invented the term 
Judo Nazi. And um, this um, was not understood at the time, I think. And when he invented it, he was talking about exactly the um, settlers um, in the 80s, the settlers supported by um, a labor government, the same government that set up the state of Israel in 1948, the same government, the same party and the same movement that has enacted the Nakba and uh, got uh, about 800,000 uh, Palestinians expelled from their own country. Um, the same government that went to the different wars in 1956 and in 1967. So uh, we are not talking about new fascists. Uh, we're talking about Zionism. And what I want to end with is that in the last two months, uh, like Tali and like Omar, I keep hearing more and more people not talking against Netanyahu, not talking against Ben Gvir, but talking for the first time against Zionism, because they understand now that the whole project of Zionism is an apartheid project, is a racist project, is a, an ex, a, a, expulsion project, is an ethnic cleansing project. And this is new. Uh, and this is uh, daily appearing in print, not just in Haaretz, but in many, many um, locations on Israeli media. So now um, Omar is right. We have a chance to explain that the problem is not Netanyahu or Ben Gvir, but the problem is Zionism and its uh, expulsions project uh, that has lasted for more than the 75 years of Israel because expulsion started in the, tw in the 1920s already. So uh, people now are able to understand and many are able to explain that the problem is the Zionist project. On this note, I want to thank our two great speakers and great uh, fighters for the uh, equality and rights of the Palestinian people and uh, to uh, pass our thanks to the movement, both uh, of the BDS movement and the Boycott From Within movement in Israel. Thank you very much. We'll close the meeting now. Thank you all for being with us.